to the book of Psalms today, if you would. Turn to the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 78 this morning. Psalm chapter 78. We're going to look at two verses in this psalm. And it's going to be verses 36 and 37. So let me give you a moment to find that place. The book of Psalms, Psalm 78, and verses 36 and 37. I hope you know this morning uh, how much I desire to be a blessing and an encouragement to you because I really, really, really want to help you. I want to be a, I want to be a encourager. Amen. I really do. I, uh, this morning the thought occurred to me that I might uh, stay home and rest because uh, i got a bit of a problem with some teeth. The tooth's giving me a bad issue this morning. It's just pounding right now as I speak, but um, uh, don't feel sorry for me because I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I want to preach. I want to teach and preach. Uh, but uh, I hope you know this morning how how much I want to be a blessing and a help to you and encourage you uh, in the faith. I hope you know that. Uh, I spend so much time in my study uh, thinking about you. Um, really, each and every one of you, I think about you. I think about uh, your place in life and your place in this church, and I think about your family and your children, and I think about what can I say, what can I do uh, behind that pulpit every Sunday to encourage you so that you leave this place with a greater desire for God. That's my desire. Uh, I, I want you to. I want you to have that desire for the Lord. Amen. And uh, and so uh, here we are embarking on the Christmas season, and there's some things I feel necessary need to be said this morning. So if you found your place, let's stand together. Psalm chapter 78, and uh, two verses that pretty much sum up the whole of chapter 78. The Bible says, Nevertheless, they, speaking about the children of Israel, did flatter him, that's God, with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues, for their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. The children of Israel had the same problem that Christians have in our day, and it's the problem of being consistent in your Christian life. It's the problem of, of, of not being faithful day in and day out um, with the Lord, walking with Him and staying close to Him, being, being, being wrapped up in that covenant that is ours with the Lord Jesus Christ, being steadfast. And there are certain seasons when it seems to be a little easier to get away from God than others. And so this morning I want to preach to you a message, it's a long title, but you'll understand. Five principles for staying right with God during Christmas time. All right? Five principles, they'll be easy to remember, you can write them down, I encourage you to do that. But five principles that I want you to carry with you this Christmas, that will help you stay right with God this Christmas. All right? Let's pray. Father, I ask now that you might encourage us through your word, strengthen us, challenge us. God, I pray today that you'll use me, that you'll use my mouth, my tongue to express your will, your word. And God, what is said, that it might be both practical and palatable. And that God's people will leave today with a greater desire to stay right with the Lord, especially during this Christmas season. And I ask it in Christ's name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You might be seated this morning. I have a love-hate relationship with holidays. I just have to be honest with you. I really do. I I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with holidays. Now, don't get me wrong. I love how holidays remind us of certain things. I, I love uh, the memory uh, part of, of, of certain holidays, the memories they create. 
the memories that we can look back upon and smile and enjoy. I love all that. I love the excitement of holidays. No doubt about that. I love it all. But, um, you know, I love, I love the, the idea of remembering mothers on Mother's Day and fathers on Father's Day and veterans on Veterans Day. And I love all that. That's well and good. No, no problem there. But most of these holidays, many of them, uh, have a tendency, okay, listen carefully, generally speaking, have a tendency to distract us. Nothing wrong with us looking in the rearview mirror while we're driving, you know, glancing at it. But you don't want to keep your eyes on the rearview mirror while you're driving. You got to keep your eyes on what's ahead and your hands on the wheel and you got to keep between the ditches and you can't always just pay attention all the time to what's in the rearview mirror. Now, it's many of these holidays remind us of certain things and that's wonderful, but they sometimes have a tendency to sidetrack us or distract us from things that are really, really important. And so Christmas is, is really one of those holidays. And you say, well, of all holidays, isn't this about Christ? Well, certainly it is. And His birth and all that's wonderful. But what I'm talking about this morning is all that other stuff. All that other stuff. The stuff and fluff and puff and all the stuff that goes with it. All this man-made stuff that is coming in. And, and tried to crowd out, if I could use the old cliche, the, the reason for the season, you see. And, and sometimes as a Christian, we get so busy. Have you thought about this? Not another holiday, there's not another holiday in our culture that demands so much time and attention as does Christmas. Now, again, back to the reason for the season, that's wonderful. I don't mind that at all. But for four or longer weeks, <laughs> we, we, so many of us are hurrying and scurrying and, and climbing ladders and, and racing down the highways and trying to get to that toy first and, 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 and make sure we got this list uh, done and that thing done. And, and sometimes in all of the hullabaloo, <laughs> we, we get sidetracked and, and we backslide. We leave off things that are important because we find other ways to spend our time. And instead of the holy day bringing us closer to the Lord, it ends up taking us away from the Lord. And there's a thing that I want to mention that really is the bottom line of what man has injected into this holiday. And it's this thing of materialism. Materialism, it's, it's crowded in, it is, and, 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 it, and, it, and it's, uh, it's caused us to be sidetracked, and it's so easy, so easy to get your eyes off of Jesus and get your eyes on stuff. Get your eyes on the material instead of the spiritual, amen? Especially in our modern culture. So much of this holiday is driven by material things, physical things, worldly things, shiny things, costly things, exciting things. And many times it takes us away from the things that matter the most. You see, materialism is really akin to humanism. Humanism. Humanism puts me first. My wants, my wishes, my goals, my things, my stuff. And the bottom line simply is that humanism is a worship of me instead of God. And materialism feeds that. Materialism uh, is the platform that feeds the ego. It, it, the more stuff I got, the more stuff I get, the more stuff even that I give. Somehow that feeds me and my pride and my ego and somehow Jesus who is the birthday person in this thing, gets missed. And he's off to the side. Oh, he's nice to be remembered, but not the, not the main attention, you see. I'm going to give you five principles this morning for staying right with God during the Christmas season. Each one of them is going to start with the word don't. Maybe that will help you remember it a little better. If you want to write them down, I would encourage you to do that this morning. First of all, if you're going to stay right with God at Christmas time, number one, 
Don't want more than you need. Pretty simple, isn't it? That's a simple little principle. Don't want more than you need. Now, does God want to give us some some blessings? No doubt about that. Uh, The Bible tells us that He gives us the desires of our heart. He's a good God to us. But, But don't want, don't let your wanter get out of control. Amen? Don't want more than you actually need. We're talking about that first Principle, the principle of contentment. There's a verse in the Bible. In fact, if you'll turn with me, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look at this with me. 1 Timothy chapter 6 this morning. We're talking about not wanting more than we need. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verses 6 through 8, notice these words. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Now, folks, that's not a suggestion. That's a commandment. Timothy, being written by Paul, tells Timothy, tell these folks, let them know. Let them know that it's great gain to be content with what you have. Just be content. Someone once said that if you'll always want what you have, then you'll always have what you want. Think about it. If you'll learn to want what you have, you'll always have what you want. You see, don't want more than you need. Well, let me give you an illustration. Grandkids come to me and say, Papa, Papa, what you want for Christmas, Papa? Tell us we want to get what you want for Christmas. Well, I usually say, I say, well, uh, uh, a tie. What about a tie? Okay, a tie's nice. Now, you know why I want a tie? If they ask, well, pre- uh, Papa, why, why you want a tie? I tell them because, see, Papa wears suits, and suits need a tie. So I'm not asking for something I necessarily want. I'm asking for something I need. Make sense? It ain't something I'm just going to throw in the corner and forget was there, you know. I use a tie. I need a tie. Amen. Amen. Now, if I really told the grandkids what I wanted, I'd tell them I want a 2023 Dodge Charger. (laughs) Black interior. 707 horsepower engine. Amen. That's what I really want. Heated seats. 20-inch wheels. You got it? Well, that ain't going to happen. Charlie knows that's what I really want. Y'all get me a car, y'all. Dodge. Charger. So the thing is, you, you'd say, well, that's a little out there. Yeah, sure it is. But, you know, sometimes we get this, you know, oh, okay, they're asking. Here's why I want to ask for something big. And, you know, look, it's not about... The gift, amen, it's really the thought behind the gift. I'd be just as happy with them coloring me a, a picture and putting on their Papa, I love you, Merry Christmas. Well, that would make my day as well as a charger. Well, almost. <laughs> amen. Listen, honestly, I, 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 my wife asked, what you want for Christmas? I really don't know. Well, I need maybe I need some a new bathrobe or a new pair of slippers. That'd be good, amen. My Keurig's still working. I got that a couple of years ago. I, that thing's still working pretty good, like my Keurig. Amen. That's doing pretty good. And my and my and my electric uh, uh, pole saw. That's still working pretty good. Okay, amen, brother R- Rusty. I don't need a whole lot. Why? Because I don't want a whole lot. I'm thankful for what I have. If we would just learn to be thankful with what God's given us, to be content with what God's given us. Paul said it like this in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Oh, listen, I, 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 uh, I just want you to know this morning that I've never, I, I know I sound pious when I say things like this, but I... I never thought that I would pastor such 
such a, a wonderful congregation. I love you with all my heart. I really do. I love thinking about you. I don't have any problem with anybody in this church as far as I know. Maybe you got a problem with me. Come see me. We'll work it out. I don't got a problem with you. I love you. I thank God for you. This is a blessed place to be. I love coming to church. I love talking to you. I love fellowshipping with you. I'm content. I'm not out looking for another church. But what do I know preachers today? They may be, you know, sitting in a pretty... A pretty good church, and you know, and things going along, and little, one little old problem, and they're already they're putting out their resumes. Send one over there, send one over there, send one over there, and and they're not content, you see. And I say to preachers, they need to be content. I need to be content. There was a time in my life when maybe I wasn't so content, and so me and Miss Starla jumped from place to place. Well, I jumped, she followed. I've been here 12 years now, working on 13. I'm content with that. I, I want you to be content in your life. Look, God's been better to us than we deserve. You, you think about it, folks. God's been far better to us than we deserve. We're so, we're so blessed. Don't want more. If you want more than you really need, if you get in, if your wanter gets out of hand, you're not going to stay right with God. You're going to get aggravated. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to, you're going to open that present. I remember one year when I was a little boy, uh, my parents bought me uh, a Bible, but they didn't tell me what it was. It was in a pack, uh, in, a, uh, in a package, and, and I would pick it up, and I would shake it, and, and I was wondering what was in there. And I come to the conclusion that it was a, a, uh, some clay. I really wanted some clay. I was a little boy, and I wanted some clay, you know, the uh, Play-Doh. Play-Doh stuff. And I thought it was a big old thing of Play-Doh. Big old. And when I opened it, it was a Bible. And I went, what? I wanted Play-Doh. Well, what I needed was that Bible. Amen. But sometimes we get to expect this stuff. Boy, I, I find it kind of amusing sometimes when folks will play a little joke and put something little in a great big box. I think it's funny. Make them go through five or six boxes to come up with something small. But the thing is, we need to be content. God wants us to be content with what He's given us. Number two, if you're going to stay right with God at Christmas time, number one, don't want more than you need. Number two, you ready? Don't spend more than you can afford. Uh oh, yeah. You me you me tell you uh, what's probably wrong with uh, with many a family today. You ready? I'll pull one out right there. Well, not that one. That's a debit card. Ain't nothing wrong with that one. <laughs> Credit card. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. You know, I was looking it up and I found out, did you know that, that uh, the average American adult has at least four credit cards? I would think they have probably have more than that. Uh, but that's what I got off the Internet. The average outstanding debt with those cards is nearly $10,000. It's a big problem. A lot of Christians are drowning in debt. Amen. Drowning in debt. You say, well, preacher, how, how do I know? How, how can I know if I'm spending more than I can afford? Well, let me ask you this. What's your liquid assets? Would you be able to pay off that bill if it came, if, if, if it came due all of a sudden all at once? Would you be able to take care of that? That's, a lot of, that's some questions to ask. But I tell you this. If you're using your credit card more than you're using your debit card, you might have a problem. Amen. 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 It gets quiet right now. You know, kind of quiet when you're talking about money. But it's so true. The fact is that many times God's people are strapped. Strapped. Because they're not wise with their money. And they go to borrowing things, and the Bible tells us in Proverbs 22, verse 7, that the rich ruleth over the poor... And the bar is servant to the lender. Now what are we talking about in this principle when I say don't spend more than you can afford? We're talking about the principle of good stewardship. That's what we're talking about. Listen folks this morning, don't you get the idea that what you have in your bank account is yours? Don't you get the idea that the house you live in is yours? Don't get the idea that all that uh, CDs and, and, and all that stuff, retire, don't, don't, no, wait a minute. Whatever you have is from God. And the Lord giveth, and the Lord can surely take it away. 
And Job found that out to be true. Yeah. I don't trust in that money. It takes wings, the Bible says, and flies away. Thing is, rich people, uh, the Bible said, are hard to be one to Christ, like a camel through an eye of a needle. Because they trust in their riches. And we're not to trust in our riches. God tells us to trust in Him. Trust in Him. But we're but stewards. That's all we are. We're stewards. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 4 and verse 10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same uh, one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And if we could understand this principle this morning at Christmas time, understand that what we think we have really is not ours, it belongs to God. God has just allowed us to be stewards of it. Amen. Stewardship. Oh, how we need to be reminded that we are but stewards and you need that principle during this holiday season or things are going to get out of whack in your life. You're going to spend what you can't afford to spend. Things are going to go like this. Well, I'll pay, I'll take from Paul and I'll pay Peter. And you think maybe you'll catch up later. And if you spend your life catching up, you're not making any progress. Well, something you need to be aware of. We need to be careful about all of us because it's so easy to get out of sorts in that area. And when that happens, it's easy to get out of sorts with God. Be careful. Number one, don't, don't want more than you need. Number two, don't spend more than you can afford. Now I'm going to dwell a little bit on this next one. You ready? Number three, don't take what already belongs to God. Don't take what already belongs to to God. Now, if you don't want more than you uh, more than you should need, or, or rather, don't want more than you need, that's the principle of contentment. Uh, don't spend more than you can afford. That's the principle of stewardship. But don't take what's already belongs to God. That's the principle of lordship. Lordship. God. God is Lord of our lives, and therefore, everything in our lives. Everything that has been dedicated to Him especially belongs to Him. The money in your bank account belongs to God. A certain part of that is given every week. The first day of the week, according to 1 Corinthians 16, you're to lay it aside on the first day of the week to give it. And in, in doing so, you have, you have fulfilled your covenant, your vow, your, your commitment to God and to His kingdom and to His church. And you do that, and then all of a sudden, some holiday comes like this one, and all of a sudden you feel like you got to buy everybody everything, and so you start doing all that, and it's so easy to take away from God what belongs to Him and spend it on something else. Don't do that. Don't do that. Miss uh, Becky was telling me this morning that we need about 600 and something dollars to pay the missionaries uh, this month, and so we're a little short there, so I'm hoping it comes in today, but you know what? You need to be reminded. If you made a vow to the Lord to give to our missions program, you need to fulfill that. You need to fulfill that. You need to be honest with yourself and with God. God knows if you're stealing. You can't stay right with God if you're stealing. Let me say that again. You ain't going to stay right with God if you're stealing. And, and the Bible says the tithe is the Lord's. So be careful about that. You've been given to God. Do that. Don't let this season take you away from your giving right. And also think about your time. We talk about the first fruits of our money, but remember we're also obligated to give God the first fruits of our time. And that's why God has called us to assemble. That's part of giving God His time, the time due Him. Church is important during the holidays. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Now, I know somebody says, well, preacher, we have family events, you know, Christmas time. We've got to go see family and do this and do that. What do you think about that? Well, listen to me carefully this morning. I would never try to make you feel guilty for spending time with your family. I'm just not going to do that. But your family needs to know who's first in your life. Sometimes you have to make a statement. Well, we had a couple in our church. I want to embarrass them. A few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I guess now, somebody in the family had 
had uh, had scheduled an event, a big event, an important event, and they did it on a Sunday. And these folks decided to make a statement, and they decided to go to church instead of go to this event. And in so doing, they were just telling their family, yes, folks, we love you. You're our family. It's, it's nothing personal. We just love God more. <laughs> and we're going to be in God's house. Boy, that's great, isn't it? I'm not saying that every couple in our church ought to make the same decisions. I'm not advocating that you turn your family against the church by not fellowshipping with them. But find ways, find ways to make sure they understand that God's first in your life. And that the church is important to you, especially during the Christmas season. Amen. Well, one or two of you believe that. Amen. And also remember this, it's not always just about your money. And it's not always about your schedule. But understand also that a certain part of our service, our energy, our ministry belongs to God. Many folks are put into the church in certain positions. And nobody here, everybody here has a place. Everybody here has, has a spot. And when you're gone, we miss you. This, it's not the same. Could you imagine what this place would look like if everybody on our church roll was at church at the same time? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I think it would be wonderful. Boy, I would bring out, I'd bring out my best sermon. Whatever that is, I don't know. But, I, you know, to have everybody... But sometimes, you know, you don't count the assembling of, of yourselves together all that important, and you need to. Be careful about that. Don't, don't fudge on your treasure or your talent or your time during the Christmas season. So don't want more than you need. Don't spend more than you can afford. Don't take what already belongs to God. Number four, don't compare what you have with others. Don't compare what you have with others. We're talking about the principle of humility here. The principle of unity. Don't be divisive about things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, the Bible says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So what happens is during the Christmas season, if we're not careful, that we have to, we feel like we have to keep up with somebody else, keeping up with the Joneses. I'm glad we don't have anybody called Jones in here, but keeping up with the Joneses. Illustration. Maybe you go outside and at dusk or dark, you look across the street and your neighbor's got lights on their roof. Big frosty snowman up there. You know, blinking lights. Yeah, whole yard's decorated. Man, they got lights everywhere and stuff everywhere. And, and you turn around and look at your little icicle lights hanging. Ain't much going on in your house. And you get a little jealous. So you got to make that trip to Walmart. Get in there as quick as you can. Get more lights. Get you a frosty. Get all that stuff out there. Oh, blow ups. If they got three, you got to have four. <laughs> Amen. And you got to make sure your yard looks every bit as there. Listen, that's not a yard problem. That's a heart problem. Amen. Amen. That's a trying to keep up with the Joneses problem. That's comparing yourself with somebody else. Don't do that during the Christmas season. Sometimes people, uh, you know, well, we're going to go somewhere, we're going to do this, good to go travel. Maybe you're not able to travel. Maybe you can't physically travel. Maybe you can't afford to travel. Uh, others may go to this and there. Don't, don't be jealous. Don't compare yourself to what. Listen, you can have just as much of the joy of Christmas as anybody else staying right where you're at. Don't be jealous. Don't let your mind go wandering about coveting what somebody else has, you know. Yeah, look at there, Starla. The neighbor got a Dodge Charger. I didn't get a Dodge Charger. Our neighbor got a... What did he get? Did he get a... He got a brand new Camaro. Okay, Starla, look at there. He got a brand new Camaro. Well, can't play that game and stay right with God. Can't do it. Man, I want you to stay right with God. Don't let this... This Christmas season, don't let this materialism, this cultural materialism take over your heart, your life. 
Don't want more than you need. Don't spend more than you can afford. Don't take what already belongs to God. Don't compare what you have with others. And last but not least, listen carefully. This is a good one. You want to stay right with God this Christmas? Don't forget how so many don't have. Don't forget how so many don't have. One of my favorite verses, scriptures, text in the Bible is found in the, in the book of, uh, of uh, Matthew, if you would, chapter 9. Matthew. It, it's, it's, it breaks my heart every time I read it. In, in Matthew chapter 9, and verses 35 through 38, listen to what happens here. It's a, a scene from the life of Christ, and he's been healing folks, and he's in Galilee. And the Bible says in verse 35 that Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness, every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he to his disciples, and I believe he said it with a tear in his eye, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he'll send forth laborers into his harvest. Now think about this scene for a moment. When he looked at the multitude and he was moved with compassion, he said that they were as, as people that fainted, the word fainted means that they had given up. Here was a group of people, as you looked across there, that had given up. Given up on life, given up on hope. They were given up, they had fainted, and were scattered abroad like so much trash. People didn't want to be around them. They were, they were, they were undesirables. And then he said he looked at them as sheep, having no shepherd. Literally means as sheep, no shepherd wanted. Nobody wanted them. Fact is this morning that we ought to look across that multitude. Don't, don't look at them and don't see yellow, red, black, and orange. And don't see African or Asian. or Don't see that. What you ought to see is a soul that needs somebody to care for them and love them. That's what Jesus saw. Remember this Christmas season, the need is so great. People need you to be charitable. They need you to be benevolent. Folks, let me get you, give you a little secret. You ready for this little secret? It's going to really hit you. It's a little secret. You ready? You and I are rich. I said we're rich. Man, we're rich. You say, well, what's your definition of rich? Folks, look. I'm I'm in a I'm in a nice building this morning preaching from a pulpit to people that love the Lord and love this place. We got a little money in the bank. We got we got a car to drive. We're going home to a good dinner, lunch. We got a good family to enjoy. Man, listen, we're rich. We don't have police officers waiting to close our doors, you know, because we're meeting against the law. We don't we don't we don't have to, you know, stand before some judge and give an account of ourselves because of our faith. We're a blessed nation. We got such freedom, such liberty here in our nation. And such blessings. And we're rich. We're rich. There ought not be anybody out there in our... I'm not a socialist. You know I'm not. I'm not advocating socialism. But as rich as we are, there ought not, there ought not be one soul in this town that doesn't get a good Christmas meal on Christmas. There ought not be one soul. Have you seen the folks walking the streets and their bicycles are full... Of, of of stuff and and they look like they hadn't been you know taken well care of they don't take care of, maybe they got a mental issue maybe they got some neurological issues and they're on the street and they're homeless and 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 listen why not just take a moment buy them a hamburger do something you say well if I, if I give them money that I don't know what they'll do with it but you know what you might be surprised. And some people, it ain't just about a hand up, it's a hand up. Our hand out, it's a hand up. We think about first step. Listen, it's sad to me to think that there's over, the lady told me there's 32 rooms, 32 rooms at first step. I said, well, how many? She said 32. That's how many ladies. Every room full. 
Sometimes we see these ladies with their little children walking the street, trying to go down to the store maybe to buy something, you know. And I think, boy, how blessed I am. You know, and they're, they're probably reeling from some violent abuse and they're hurting in their soul and their little children are wondering what's going to happen next. And, and we go on our merry way, whistling Dixie and as if they're not even there. And sometimes we ought to just stop and, and do like Jesus, see, some, see them people. He saw the multitude. He looked upon them and had compassion. How many people are you having compassion on this Christmas? How many people are you going to try to help this Christmas? I hope that you'll be ready and willing to pick up things and put in that box to help with first step. I hope you'll do that. But you know, however you can help somebody in need, remember, he that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. <laughs> and that which he hath given will he repay or pay him, him, pay him back, pay him again. Proverbs 20 or 19 verse 17. Listen, that's, that's, a, that's a promise from God. You remember when Saul was going after the church at Damascus and outside and, and the light shone down. It was Jesus. Who are you? It's Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, whom thou persecutest. Wait a minute. He wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting the church. And yet Jesus identified with his church. You hurt them, you hurt me. Then when you look around and see so many people hurting during the Christmas season, it ought to hurt you. Hurt you. Oh, it's not about us, folks, is it? It's about Jesus. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in still another village where he worked in a carpenter shop till he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family, never owned a house. He did not go to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that one usually associates with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone. And today, listen to me. He remains the central figure of the human race. The leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched. All the navies that have ever sailed. All the parliaments that have ever sat. All the kings that have ever reigned. Put together have not affected the life of man on this earth so much as that one solitary life. His name is Jesus. If we'll keep our eyes on Him this Christmas season, we'll stay right with God. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, I want to be a help. I pray that these words were a help to God's people to challenge all of us to keep our eyes on You this Christmas season. And Lord, I trust and pray that we'll not overspend, that we'll not overdo, that Lord will be charitable and benevolent when it comes to folks in need, and that Lord will be a church that, that is a blessing to others. Help us to do that. And God